Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, welcome, thank you for joining us today for the Nelson Hall IT Services webinar looking at market drivers uh, and key events. My name is John Larty. If we could just move to the next slide, please, Beth. Thank you. Um, so I'll just quickly um, give a heads up on the uh, agenda for today's webinar. Um, I'll give a very brief introduction shortly to the IT services team, just a very quick heads up on our research schedule for the next um, 12 months. But really, we want to get into the, the meat of the presentation, really. Um, we're going to look at the IT services market uh, and give our view on the forecast and some of the key drives and trends we're seeing, which Dominique will pick up. David then will give us a view on platform services and SAP cloud migration. And I'll give a heads up on what we're seeing from a digital workplace services perspective as well. We'll also touch on some of the M&A trends that we've been seeing across IT services, in particular, looking at some of the Salesforce acquisitions and Dominique uh, will give us some more insight there. And then David will look at some of the SAP acquisitions as well. And Dominique will also give us a heads up on the IBM Kindrel spin-off and the Nelson Hall perspective on that. And at the end, we'll wrap up and hopefully we'll have time for some questions. If we could just go to the next slide, please, Beth. Thank you. Um, just to give a very quick introduction to the team. Uh, my name is John Larty. I'm based in Manchester in the UK. Uh, and my primary focus within the team is I look at digital workplace. I also look at cloud infrastructure brokerage, orchestration, management and migration. And I also look at cognitive and self-healing IT infrastructure management services. I'm joined on the call by my colleague, David McIntyre. David's based in Denver and Colorado. And David's focus is around experience consulting and design, modern application services, and enterprise application services. And we're also joined by Dominique Raviat. Dominique is based in Paris in France. And Dominique focuses on quality assurance and crowd testing, Salesforce services, and digital manufacturing services. If we could just go to the next slide, please, Beth. Um, I won't go through all the topics here, um, just to give you a heads up really in terms of the research topic for the IT services team over the next 12 months. On the Nelson Hall website, we also have an analyst relations portal that lists in detail all of the projects and project descriptions. Um, for those of you that we engage with on a regular basis, as you're aware, we tend to reach out to you probably a month before the project starts. For those on the call that may be new to, uh, may be new to Nelson Hall and you're interested in any of those projects, then please feel free to reach out to myself or Dominique or David or Beth after the call. But as I say, on the Nelson Hall website, you can go through the AR portal at your leisure and look at our project schedule for the next 12 months. Thank you. If we could just move on to the next slide, please, Beth. I'd now um, like to hand over to Dominique that will start the, the more in-depth deep dive now into the IT services market with a view of the overall IT services market forecast growth and trends that we're seeing. If I can hand over to you, please, Dominique. Thank you, John. Hi, everyone. Lovely to be here on this call today. Lovely, Beth. Thank you. So I'll start by another view of what's going on, what we think is going to happen in 2021 and going forward. We, if I had to sum up this slide, we're back to sort of semi-normal type of patterns. We're expecting 2021 3.3% growth, which is probably half through um, the best um, years. So if you think six, five, five, six percent ish is sort of the best years we've half it through it. So in terms of IT service spending this year, we sort we've clearly exited the, the pandemic. Although as you know we see still consider the impact of the pandemic in quite a number of regions, if not all across the world. So but from an IT service perspective, um, um, you know, 2020 was not as bad as expected, and 2021 is half a free recovery, although it's not as good as we thought it would be one year ago. So looking by service line very quickly, infrastructure services typically varies between minus three plus three in during bad times to good times, again, 1.2% roughly. Uh, we have here through the journey. Application services, we're getting closer to, to the best times, uh, five, six percent maximum in the best times in terms of growth. 
of course, driven by digital and migration of applications to the cloud, consulting services, the most cyclical type of activity, 3.6, showing that we're back into um, consulting mode. And of course, with the new technologies, that's that's quite understandable. I'll stop here for the overall view, and I'll probably ask Beth to move on to the next slide. And I think that's about, yes, that's for you, David. It is, thank you. Thank you, Dominique, and hello, everybody. Um, yeah, so taking kind of a drill down uh, on what we were just looking at, um, we recently completed an SAP ERP cloud uh, services project. And what we see is that that's a very small but rapidly growing component of platform services. And platform services broadly is what we look at um, that encompasses services around SAP, around Salesforce, around Oracle, things like that. And, and as you can see, platform services as a subset within application services accounts for roughly a third of that, um, of overall application services. And it's, as you can see, it's actually projected to grow significantly faster than the overall application services market. Um, and, and within this, as I said, one of the small components is SAP ERP uh, cloud services which is growing significantly faster, though it's obviously very small. Um, and you can actually see this starting to play out as, as this week SAP pre-announced uh, their Q1 uh, earnings um, and their slightly different definition of their SAP cloud services. They had they showed a 7% growth in revenue, 13% uh, at uh, constant currency, and a 19% 19 growth in backlog. So they're actually seeing significant focus on their offerings being hosted in the cloud. Um, and I think there's a couple drivers for this. One is the overall focus on, on cost reduction and ERP transformation is, is a, has been a challenging area from a business case perspective and, and cloud certainly helps that. And when you're looking at the hopefully post pandemic world, having some tangible cost reductions early on is an important um, component of, of these broader digital transformations, these broader ERP transformations and, and cloud certainly provides that. Um, and, and to that end, one of the, the big initiatives you've seen SAP introduce this year is their, their rise with SAP offering. And, and if you don't know what that is, it's um, a new bundled offering, essentially their S4 HANA sitting in the cloud um, with standard processes, with standard tools and assets to help and simplify and accelerate the migration. Um, so it's a very kind of simplified bundle of offering. And, and they're looking at this as really a, a way to kickstart some of that S4 HANA adoption that may have been a little slower than they may have expected. Um, I do think, I think our perspective is it may not formal, for, uh, totally address the area that has not, uh, that has been the slowest in the S4 HANA. So the large enterprises with um, significant customized monolithic on premise ERPs may not be the ones moving to rise with um, SAP. Um, they, they will probably continue to focus on the multi-phase journey to a uh, cloud-based S4 HANA um, in the long term uh, before the end of support in the late 2020s. But um, rise with SAP certainly could help broaden the, the umbrella of people adopting SAP. Um, and if we look at uh, how this impacts IT service vendors with this new bundled simplified offering, I think there's two key areas where IT service vendors can support and really help and provide value over and above what SAP is. Uh, the first one is around providing an industry capability. Um, so adding functional extensions integrated with the Rise with SAP offering, providing um, standardized configurations for processes specific to industry sectors, you know, really bringing that slightly more level of customization that clients have started seeing with model company and things like that previously. And I think the other area where IT service vendors are going to see significant demand is, is the softer um, consulting capabilities around the technical migration. So being a, the, the key value of an S4 HANA migration is the process simplification and the process transformation. So enabling that through organization and change management and process redesign and process consulting capabilities, I think is, is going to be a key area of focus uh, going forward to support these SAP migration offerings. So let me hand it back uh, to John actually to talk about digital workplace uh, projections. Thanks, David. Yeah, I think from a digital workplace perspective, we expect to see growth continuing in 2021. I think in 2020, clearly on the back of COVID, we saw a lot of growth in terms of the need to enable people to work remotely. 
I think the role that digital workplace plays now in 2021 and beyond really is as we come through COVID and hopefully we'll be through COVID soon really is the adapting to this new hybrid workplace environment and the role that digital workplace will play in terms of improving the overall um, collaboration within the organization, but also enabling organizations that have invested in technologies to derive the most benefits from those in terms of ensuring they have the latest updates and licenses, et cetera, is gonna be really key moving forward. I think in parallel with that, we're gonna see a much greater adoption now of AI and analytics and automation and a big, big focus now on data and the utilization of data to drive real-time data insights. So it's almost like moving away, if you like, from the traditional L1, L2, L3 mindset to a data-driven proactive experience center where you have site reliability engineers acting upon recommendation from self-healing solutions, where you have automation architects and machine coaches creating this overall predictive environment within the workplace, whereby end user issues are rectified before the end user has an issue. Um, and I think increasingly important as well, I think from organizations, as I said earlier, is this utilization of the data. There's a plethora of data across the workplace. And in order to understand that data, it helps to improve the overall collaboration within the workplace and using the analytics to inform the cognitive and then using the automation to take the action. I think in parallel with that, we're seeing a much greater focus now in 2021 on user experience and experience level agreements. I think experience level agreements were fairly nascent previously, but I think there's more client appetite now to move forward on experience level agreements. Uh, once they can see the outcomes that can be driven from some of the pilots and POCs, I think we'll see much more commercialization of these moving forward. And I think from a user experience perspective, this becomes even more critical in the hybrid working environment, really, in terms of measuring not only the productivity, but also the sentiment on an end user's device, on their network, on their application, and even on their persona to ensure that they can drive the employee experience within this new hybrid uh, working environment. And I think as well, what we're seeing as well is a much greater focus now on the adoption of go-to-market services and joint solutions with the hyperscalers, uh, particularly Microsoft and AWS and GCP. But I also see the role of the digital workplace vendors evolving more now as well in terms of the client appetite now to develop much deeper ecosystems in terms of the technologies and partners that they use and the digital workplace vendor really being there to sort of orchestrate all these services and create this API integration to enable the, the clients to offer their end users the technologies that they choose to use and having that ability to measure that user experience as well and driving those experience level agreements. So I think as in 20, I think in 2021, we're gonna see continued growth in digital workplace and beyond. Thanks, Beth. And we can move to the next area now, which touches on the M&A trends that I mentioned earlier. I think the first one is over to Dominique on Salesforce. No, it's actually me. I'm going to take Sorry, this um, and then go to SAP as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, but before we dive into a couple specific areas, we wanted to uh, kind of look more holistically at, at the broader trends within the uh, M&A market. Um, so one of the standard things we do is we, we tend to track any public announcements by any IT services firm. So we've got a standard tracking service we do. And, and what we decided to do, we went back and we looked at the last six months roughly of, of data within our tracking service. Uh, so spanning from essentially September, 2020 through the middle of March uh, this year. And we looked at uh, merger and acquisition announcements from IT services vendors firms. And, and what we came, came up with about 17 different vendors had made roughly 52 acquisitions uh, from September to mid-March. And so we started to kind of slice and dice that data a little bit just to see what we could find from a trends perspective. Um, and as you can see on, on the left, um, uh, kind of building on this uh, theme we talked about earlier, one in four of those acquisitions was actually focused on platform services. Um, and this 
covered, uh, the most common one that was covered was Salesforce that accounted for almost half, I think, or even more than half of these platform services acquisitions, um, followed by SAP and, and ServiceNow acquisitions as well. So you can see um, why we expect that area to grow so significantly going forward. It's clearly a, a major focus area, both for um, clients and for vendors themselves. Um, just to provide a little more color going down to some of the other areas, um, from a consulting perspective, um, what we saw was a, a lot of focus on some of the softer skills, kind of change management, organizational change capabilities, leadership consulting type capabilities, as well as some more industry specific consulting. For example, uh, Wipro's acquisition of Capco recently really drives its financial services capabilities. Um, similarly, just looking um, down further at the industry specific acquisitions. These may be broader than just consulting, but they're very focused on industries. Um, and the industries we saw uh, driving those acquisitions, again, were, were banking and insurance as well as pharma. Um, and then finally, on the business function capability uh, near the bottom, we see these uh, spanning both supply chain and payments type of capabilities. So you can see some common threads rolling through here around uh, financial services and um, uh, payments and things like that. So there are some common threads on, on where we're seeing some specific focus. If we pivot to the geographic view, um, as you'd expect, the U.S. Uh, takes up the largest uh, chunk as far as uh, where these acquired companies are based, um, with the U.K. being uh, close behind. I think the, the most interesting aspect of it is, as you can see at the top in the blue section on the, the pie chart, um, Australia, New Zealand takes a, a significant component of growth. And I think there, you know, there's a couple of reasons for that. And while it spans the capabilities on the left, um, including platform capabilities, application services, consulting capabilities, what I think you're seeing from an Australia, New Zealand is one, I think they were, you know, impacted maybe slightly less in the pandemic. So, so they're, um, you know, they may be expected or, or positioned well for growth going forward. But also I think that provides companies that maybe have been historically more Western centric for lack of a better word, US and Europe focused, it gives them a, a foundation and a base to continue to grow their Asia Pacific uh, capabilities. Um, and so this becomes you know, a home base that not only can address the Australian New Zealand market, but can start to move up into you know, some of the, the Southeast Asian countries as well and really built, become like a, a third pillar within a, a company's global footprint. So Beth, if you wanna go on to the next slide. So a slight pivot in a um, focus area. So building on some of the SAP work we did, if you, if you change the time scales a little bit and look a little more broadly, this is roughly over the last 10 years or so uh, of key um, SAP capability acquisitions. And we really want to understand what were the drivers of those acquisitions. And obviously every acquisition has multiple components and multiple drivers, but there's typically a, a one primary focus area of what drove that acquisition. And, and what we saw were there's three main areas. First was the focus on a geographic expansion. Um, so buying a, a, sm a smaller capability to really build and grow a specific geographic capability. Um, that was, as you can see, a majority of the acquisitions over the last several years. And, and just to give a specific example, Wipro, for example, has acquired companies in both Germany and Brazil, which now act as the backbones of delivery for these two growth focus areas. Um, the second area is specifically around a sector. So a building out sector specific capabilities. Um, and an example there is Atos, who has actually acquired two different companies that have a specialty in SAP focused on the utilities industry. So going back to, to my point earlier about SAP and building that industry specific, um, this allows you know, very tailored and, and focused to you know, utility specific requirements. And the final is expanding a specific kind of niche capability within the broader SAP ecosystem. So um, slightly different, DXE technology acquired uh, virtual clarity, which is expands its consulting. So the, the road mapping and the planning and the consulting capabilities up front. Um, and then in parallel, NTT data acquired Weavability, which was specific, which specifically augments its CRM capabilities. So within within that umbrella, you know, it's an a, ability to focus and, and grow just that CRM component and um, you know integrate that with its broader um, SAP capabilities.
So now I will hand back to Dominique, who's going to talk about uh, Salesforce acquisitions. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, Beth, as well. So we're taking a different perspective here. So we're going, looking at the demographics of acquired Salesforce partners over the past, well, eight to nine years, I guess. And, and typically, this, there's been two waves of MNAs, one which was much more in 2016 and 17. Um, as a duration. So that was really when I think um, the IT services vendors and consulting ones as well sort of rediscovered Salesforce and decided um, Salesforce was an enterprise grade type of service, not SMBs only. So there was a wave of large scale acquisition by Salesforce and that's so some 500 to 1000 headcounts type of organizations. And we're actually going through the second wave, uh, which went on in 2020 and is actually accelerated in 2021. So 2021 should be even more active here than last year. A couple of comments on, on our trends, I should say. Um, we're still seeing geographic expansion um, in a similar manner that um, David mentioned with SAP's capabilities. So, um, expanding mostly now from US to Europe slash ANZ or Australia, I should say, in those years, in 2020, 2021. And at the same time, um, acquisition of fairly specialized skills um, that's most of the time happening in the US, but not exclusively. Um, I can think of um, quote to cash, um, MuleSoft type of activities mostly. And, and that's happening. So, um, the usual question I get when I present this slide is how is that going to change? Is that going to be a third wave of, and my response is of course, yes, with um, Salesforce being so acquisitive, there has to be another wave of, of acquisition from a service point of view. I must say that the, you, so the two most recent or among the most recent acquisition Tableau and the forthcoming Slack, uh, we're not expecting a big wave activity in terms of acquisition, but certainly um, we still see a lot of of of, um, of appetite around MuleSoft and 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 Velocity probably is the next wave. So that's what I wanted to mention on Salesforce services. And Beth, if you don't mind going to the next slide, um, I'd like to sum up our thoughts about the new boys in in you know the new kid in town for uh, for joke about let me try to, to pronounce this correctly Kindrel Kindrel and IBM first so Kindrel is is the spinner for IBM taking over quite a large chunk of of what was of what is GTS and 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 IBM is is right in saying this is probably one you know the largest infrastructure pure plays if you exclude. Um, the Amazon Web Services of this world. So this is a massive firm in terms of IT services capabilities. Um, IBM has mentioned that in short term, Kindle would be um, looking, you know, favoring profitability of our growth. And um, I'll mention this in a few minutes. I think we, from our perspective, going from the facts to a bit of our analysis, we think um, uh, Kindle will have, will have a you know, very strong offering in end user computing or digital workplace, I should say. And, but we have gaps in data center services capabilities. And those gaps, as you know, will be in the cloud space, whether it's public cloud and, 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 and OpenShift, Red Hat OpenShift, so private cloud building. So we'll have, we'll have a firm that have a gap in its offering. And we think the next step for Kindle will be, you know, do more um, uh, partnership with the hyperscalers of this world to fill up its cl uh, uh, public cloud capabilities, of course, but also work more with, with now the, the, the spin off PMware and on, on the private one. And also accelerate on automation analytics again from the hyperscalers. And we think uh, that Kindrel will be in a, in a very unusual role type of situation, situation where it'd be a very large IT service center with a very um, infrastructure services offering. So we'll expect it to do MNAs initially in infrastructure services, but um, I'm not aware of any large firm in the world that has an infrastructure service only type of capability or so respect of, of time to expand to a competitor of GPS, so into application services. So with, with thinking role over time, will we'll, um, recreate itself significantly towards a full play IT service house. 
Um, IBM pass split, uh, services pass split will be in a different situation with a very refreshed um, portfolio in services I'm, I'm thinking of. So public cloud, security, Red Hat, um, OpenShift type of private cloud services. Um, and really IBM is expanding growth in consulting and application services, GBS, and also I should say by digital with Salesforce as a spearhead, I would think, and SAP as well. Um, we don't, we're not expecting IBM to do as many acquisitions as Quindrel or not as transformative for a couple of reasons. First of all, its portfolio is much, much more refreshed. And second of all, IBM um, past Quindrel will have an, an update that is heavily impacted by the Red Hat acquisition. So very different type of trajectories for two, stand, um, for two standalone firms, but still very significant in, in terms of size and revenues. And that's probably all I wanted to mention about Kindrel. And I'm, 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 I'm quite, I, I probably should know how to pronounce this word better, but um, this is, I, can, I think we can now turn to Q and A's and to Beth and John to, to provide us with the questions, I guess, by, by chat. Thank you. Okay, so Dominique, um, on the economic recovery, uh, on which economic recovery are your forecast based? Thank you, Beth. Um, as, as a standard, we use the IMMF um, sort of predictions and forecasts based on GDPs. Um, having said that, uh, we adapt them because um, there's no direct linkage between spending, IT service spending and consulting spending and the IMF. So the IMF provides us a direction and we make then a number of adjustments. Um, if only, for example, as I mentioned, our IT infrastructure services are much less likely called than application services. So a rise in GDP doesn't have the same impact. So that, that's, that's one comment. The second comment is an important factor as well is more than the IMF um, uh, or equally important to the IMF um, predictions. Business morale is important as well and we take those into, accounts, into account. Okay, I think we have, we have time for one more question here. Um, is, is the client's agenda like, still? Oh, oh go ahead. Looks a couple just came in on the chat as well. Oh, okay, perfect. You want to? Can you? You want to read those? Yeah. Uh, um, first one. Uh, do you have examples of services companies setting up hyperscaler BUs? How are they structured? Um, John, did you want to ha handle that one? Yeah, I think in terms of organizations okay. setting up dedicated hyperscaler units, I think we're seeing. Um, a few of those, I think some good casing examples, probably TCS in terms of the, the dedicated Microsoft practice that they have, and now the AWS practice and GCP as well. Um, Emphasis, I think, are another casing example as well in terms of driving that hyperscaler specific business type units. And I think we're seeing this adoption as well broadly across a lot of the other vendors as well um, in terms of creating this capability. And, and again, back to the point I made earlier in terms of digital workplace as well, I think we're seeing now these dedicated business units being created to feed into the digital workplace capabilities across the entire enterprise as well. Uh, and I think that trend will continue. Yeah, I think uh, kind of building on that, you're right. I mean, if you look at like Infosys's uh, Cobalt, right, they're building individual business units dedicated to each of the major hyperscalers, AWS, uh, Microsoft, Google. And I think these act as horizontals working across the industry sectors and working as, you know, in conjunction with uh, the specific areas, even if it's, a, you know, an SAP um, migration, for example, right, there is a... Um, you know, collaborative effort in, in building an integrated offering that spans both this dedicated hyperscaler BU as well as the SAP. So building these kind of cross level of assets, but then standing alone as, as, a, as a, its own horizontal. Um, another question that came in, um, looking more closely at the hybrid office, do you have thoughts on how much investment enterprises will have in making better use of IOTs, sensors um, and within smart buildings? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think, yeah, I think there will be um, increased investment in that area. I think pre-COVID, we were starting to see investment in that in digital workplace, particularly in some of the, the smart office capabilities and the use of sort of IoT and sensors and wayfinding solutions and the ability to sort of 
um, find out, you know, book meeting rooms and, you know, things such as that. I think obviously, you know, as COVID hit, a lot of those changed. But I think as we go back to the hybrid working environment, I think they will be increasingly important, if not more important. Um, and certainly the buy side clients that we've been speaking to have suggested that there will be much more investment in those areas. And I think from vendors as well, we see much more investment in terms of sort of the, the IoT and the immersive capabilities as well, particularly around sort of augmented and virtual reality as well. And I expect that trend to continue quite significantly in 2021 as well. And John, if I may take um, uh, may follow up on your uh, comment from a um, digital manufacturing perspective, so for a shop floor type of plant um, perspective, so smart buildings, um, we had seen f f a, few, a few pilot activity, few massive deployments in, in the factories. Now with the new um, appetite for sustainability and also really, to be honest, uh, cost savings, we, we think there will be more activity around smart buildings and energy savings to be very specific uh, in the years to come, probably not in 2021, but a bit of a wake up in, in during this year with you know, spending probably delayed in one to two years. Great, and I think we're- um, That's all that's coming on the chat, Beth. I don't, yeah, I don't know how much- you Yeah, and I think we're actually that. out of time. So that uh, okay. nice, nice work, the three of you getting that <laughs> all in in a half hour. Um, I will be, you know, sharing the recording uh, following. So anyone that couldn't make it will get it as well as the people that are on today. And we thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Everyone. Thank you all. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good day.